Hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the official Rockfish Games stream. I am your host, Eric Schrader, the Community Ambassador. Uh, you can also call me Giraffasaur, it's my online handle. Oh my goodness, Ugh. what do we have for you today? I don't even know. Goodness gravy, that's right, we're talking about the lore, all of that rich, deep content within the Everspace series itself. Oh my gosh, we're going to be talking about it a lot. Uh, we're starting with Everspace 1, and we will be transitioning into a little bit of information for Everspace 2. Um, most of this is going to be found through the VOGs that we've already posted. So, it's not going to be like exploring new knowledge, but my hope, my goal here, is that we're all going to be able to talk about this together, and you're going to learn a lot about why we've established the game world the way it has been, and what we want to do with that moving forward. For those of you who didn't really pay attention to the story of Everspace 1, we totally understand. It's a very challenging game, so like, seriously, we get it, we understand. Um, this should be a pretty enlightening process for you then. Um, and if you already know a lot of the story, maybe you'll be surprised and see something here that you didn't catch the first time. So uh, we have a lot of people to also shout out and give a lot of praise to this stream as well. Because uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of like putting the story together, I mean, it didn't just, a, it wasn't just established from us at Rockfish. Like you guys also kind of like help bring it together as well. And I'll explain that whenever we get there. So welcome to everybody over on Twitch, YouTube, Mixer. I think we're over on Steam as well. I think, I hope. I think everything's checking out. So that's good. Um, looking, looking super great as always. Oh my gosh, look at all these fine folks in the chat. Oh my gosh. It is such a pleasure to have you all here. Oh my goodness. <coughs> Getting some serious audio and video stuttering. Oh no, is anybody else having any issues or are we good? Says the audio is fine now. I just want to make sure. So if we have any audio problems for a lore-centric stream, that's a problem. That's a big problem, because there's going to be a lot of conversation, a lot of dialogue being shared here. It's a Twitch issue? Well, pff, goodness. All right, well, that's fine. But welcome, everybody, to the chat. It's it's a delight to see you all, and over everywhere, all, where, where all of you are at. So what we're going to be doing here... Uh, the first thing that we're going to be capitalizing on is like the like the beginnings of Everspace and why the game world was established the way it was and the story that we wanted to tell you, okay? Um, and then we will move forward. So um, <laughs> I wanted to say, raise your hands if you've played Everspace before, but that'd be silly. Oh my goodness. But um, I know that a lot of you have. For those of you who haven't, I honestly still encourage you to, to hang out in the stream and listen to the story because the story is hard to digest the first time you play it. It's in like, especially even after like 10 times playing it, 20 times, it's still a little bit hard to digest. So I think that this will be really informative in a good way, not in a, oh, it broke my experience of the game way. You know what I mean? Hmm. So very good. Oh, everybody's raising their hands. Perfect. Okay, so... Um, the big, big thing that I really, really want to talk about is going to be um, this in-game content um, that is known as the Codex. Because this is going to give us a lot of details of, like, where things started from. Uh, where's, where's the Codex? Right here. Perfect. So, let's, let's start from square one. The very first thing that we wanted to do with this world that we're presenting to you... This whole Everspace thing is we wanted to take it completely out of any sort of relationship with real world application. What I mean by that is this is in no way related to Earth at all. Like it's all completely super light years away, like completely different sector of space. Yeah, we know that Earth exists. We'll talk about that and where like we we came from Earth in some capacity or degree, at least our ancestors. But like this is not some sort of like we are Earth. This is our mission and, and connecting all the dots. No, no, no. This is very much removed from that sort of real world application, literally. Um, and now it's we have our own sort of area of space that we can do whatever we want with. Um, so, um, in order to have conflict, you need characters, right? 
You misplaced Earth, didn't you? Slightly, okay? It's just a, it's just a, a, a little a faux pas, okay? Somebody plugged in a coordinate wrong? Who'd have thought that an extra zero would cause that much of a problem? But, um, so with, conf with story, you have to have conflict. You have to have purpose. You have to have drive, etc., etc. Base level story elements of storytelling, and that's what we are mostly concerned about today in this stream. So, um, so let's get started with the factions. These different sort of uh, uh, bodies that impact everything that's going on. So, before we even look at the flashbacks, before we even get into the clone series, if you will, there were conflicts between this colonial fleet and these Okar, okay? Um, and I do think, I think that this is going to be okay that I read this verbatim since there could be some points in here that maybe some of you kind of like skimmed over. So I am going to be doing a little bit of a, you can see it on screen, but I'm also going to read it. So bear with me. But again, there's a lot of that rich detail. So it's, it should be good. It should be important. So, whew. We're going to start with the Colonial Fleet. And again, this is before before the clones, before before Adam Rosslyn, everything, okay? So Colonial Fleet. The Colonial Fleet is the vanguard and defense infrastructure of human galactic expansion. Originating from the Soul System, the relatively recent development of interstellar travel led to a rapid demand for more able bodies to explore and occupy new regions. The sophisticated cloning technology developed to meet this demand has become both the envy of and reveled by other races. Although the fleet consists predominantly of humanoids, other alien races enroll or collaborate independently. So what we see here just straight out of the gate, we understand that colonials, it's not like just all humans. You don't have to be human to be colonial, okay? This is not um, this is not kind of what they do with, uh, say, the the empire, if you will. Um, so it's very much like a anybody can join sort of thing, but it's primarily from the soul system, so it's mostly humans. Um, one second, I do apologize. I need to send a quick text message. So sorry. So, with the colonial feet, uh, and having this new cloning technology and now being envied by other races, we're seeing that that's already starting just a little bit of conflict in and of itself. Because we're at a state at this time where our technology is already starting to like cause trouble with other sentient life. So, the fleet's prim primary purpose in Cluster 34, this is going to come up a lot by the way. If you are not familiar with Cluster 34, uh, we're going to expand upon it a bit more, but essentially that is where you play the game of Everspace. And also, where Everspace 2 is going to have a lot of interactions in as well. So the fleet's primary purpose in Cluster 34 is protection of mining interests, which are managed by private corporations against outlaw raiders. A heavy military presence maintains the peace in the outer limits of colonial territories, and it is ministered from the vast colonial fleet HQ. In accordance with the peace treaty with the Okar, the fleet is not permitted access to the demilitarized zone except for special situations, such as rescue or humanitarian relief missions. All right. Dropping a lot of knowledge here, okay? So this little second bit, this is already going a little bit forward. So let's go ahead and jump forward a little bit. We have the Colonials, some pretty superior technology, some of the best work that humanity has accomplished, starting to meet up, greet up, and help out other alien species and races and all of that stuff and things. And now they have this focus on Cluster 34 because it's mineral rich. There's vast opportunities, growth, new colonization. It's just a breeding ground for humanity. And we're like, yes, yes, I, yes, please. I want to go here. I want to do the things. Let's do it. So now um, we have a conflict that arises. Uh, it says in accordance with the peace treaty with the Okar. What does that mean? Well, let's talk about the Okar first. Uh, because whenever 
The Colonial Fleet warps into Cluster 34. They encounter these guys. The Okar are a reptilian race inhabiting several systems in Cluster 34. All right. So just straight out of the gate, we see that like our Colonials, right? We're going to use... <laughs> you know what was going to happen. Like, let's be real. So we've got, we've got some Colonials, right? Okay. Like... Let's actually, let's get real. It's like a lot of colonials. Okay. So we got like lots of freaking colonials like warping in. Right. And, and the Okar are just like, what the freaking heck? Like, this is our territory. This, what is even happening? So like the colonials are basically like, you know, like driving on in here and the Okar are like, nah, this ain't going to fly. So then we're like having this major conflict where the Colonials and the Okar are just freaking duking it out, right? Um, so the Okar in this area, uh, all this conflict starts with, these are a bipedal lizard-like species. They evolved from their dry desert homeworld and spread some millennia ago to neighboring planets. So they have existed in Cluster 34 well prior, like freaking well prior to um our our humanity expansion stuff right these are the ones who exist there they're the ones who have been doing everything they're the ones like they have ownership over this place right so we're the invaders this is important it'll probably come up again later and like a sequel or something so they evolved uh millennia ago to their neighboring planets they are a secretive race telepathic to a limited degree and have a natural aversion to water which kind of makes sense since they're from a desert planet not known for ambitious expansionism they are generally peaceful and inward looking although violently reactive to new influences from beyond own, their own worlds the arrival of the colonials in the early 31st century triggered a panic which led to a devastating conflict who'd have thought oh my goodness yeah i need to adjust my transparencies because this seriously the oak guard you shouldn't be able to see right through them oh there we go just i just gotta get the right angle hmm that's that's small fleet here let's go big big fleet big fleet oak guard all right perfect <clears throat> devastating conflict now um unfortunately my representation of the conflict was little to be desired. It looked like the Colonials attacked and the Okar were just like, nah, you can't touch this. That was an inaccurate representation. Essentially what happened is that uh, whenever they locked in and they were duking it out, it was devastating. Absolutely savage on both sides. Um, and one of the flashbacks that we will get to eventually, it says that the war was uh, something like equally devastating but mutually short. Something like that. Or, or some, some, some wordage like that. Basically, lots of destruction, boom, booms, but then it like all slowed down really quick because nobody was left. Like everybody died, okay? So, a little bit more on the Okar, then we'll keep moving. A long lifespan, up to 250 soul years. So these guys probably are kind of wise as well. And stable social conditions have allowed for significant development of technologies and culture on a par to human advancement. In the course of colonial expansion, the Ogar are the first encountered alien race to be equally matched in strength and sophistication. So this is the sentient species that challenges humanity, all right? And of course, when we tried to expand, it, it was real bad, real bad. Hmm. Baby carrots are wonderful. So, the Colonial Okar uh, War, this is a very significant moment in history within our universe, and this is actually what kind of like throws everything in motion, okay? So that's, that's like the start of our story, that's like the foundation that everybody needs to know if you want to know anything about the lore, if you want to have an understanding of how things get shaped and changed in this universe. Okar, colonial conflicts, all right? 
Man, I wish I had, I actually wish that I had like a, a little set of glasses because I think it'd be really funny right now if I'm just, and now we're going to read, you know, just something silly. Oh my gosh. All right. So now we're going to go into these outlaws. Um, actually, no. First, we're going to go to Gradient Brunt and then we're going to go to outlaws. This is important. This is important. So uh, a lot of people have kind of surmised that the, um, that the GMB, Gradient Brunt Prospects, they were they're they're like their own faction they operate independently so this is sort of true but not not true grady and brunt are mostly colonial actually they're mostly colonial the only separation the only reason why they're called grady and brunt and not colonial is because they only have one task ahead and they are no longer militaristic okay so let's talk about them for for a second Gradient Brunt Prospects is the monolithic colonial interstellar mining concern which holds several regional monopolies throughout the galaxy. Throughout the galaxy. Not, not cluster 34, but like, woof, everything, all right? As well as resource extraction and logistics, the corporation has invested heavily in drone, weapons, and jump gates technologies to secure its supremacy in the industry sector some keywords here supremacy monopoly jump gates these are all very important to grady and brunt because they control all of it okay close ties with the colonial fleet has drawn criticism of cronyism in the past although there are few viable concerns capable of handling the vast task of colonial ambitions Formed in the mid-19th century, Earth, by Oswald Grady during a gold resource rush in an area that, that then known as California, an early partnership with another prospector by the name of William Brunt established a two-family enterprise which operated on a small local scale until the mid-21st century. So we got, we got information that this all started, Grady and Brunt started in freaking California, okay? Wow. Boom. Crazy. In 2046, the company was inherited by direct descendant Zeppo Grady, considered a visionary, who quickly expanded the business outwards with the invention of asteroid hunting drones to bring resource-rich rocks into Earth's low orbit for dismantling. The concern has continued to grow exponentially since that time, uh, interrupted only by periodic wars and the destruction of its home state. Grady and Brunt was the first Earth-based concern to attain the title Interstellar corporation i see some questions in chat i'm going to make sure that they're getting answered weren't the initial conflicts based on a misunderstanding this is correct we will get to that shortly but um but to like answer that answer that just kind of like in the moment basically if you were living in like this hunked down space and everything was peaceful everything was fine and then all of a sudden these massive warships and transports warped in how would you respond? Like we're talking crazy huge, right? So something something to keep in mind, we're gonna jump over here to Okar to answer this, is that the Okar um, violently reactive to new influences from beyond their own worlds. This is key. Violently reactive to new influences from beyond their own worlds. So when something that is not their own shows up, they're like, oh, hell no. And they attack. They don't go into peace treaties. They don't go into like, okay, negotiations. No, they're just like, that doesn't belong here. Fire all lasers. This is how the Okar colonial conflict began. It's because the Okar flipped the table and they, they couldn't, they, they just went all out. And the colonials were like, oh, we're under attack by an alien species. We have to eradicate them. Firepower was matched. Almost everybody died. Now we have this entire cluster 34 that's littered with military parts that some punk could like fly through and collect and better their ship every run. All right. So continuing Grady and Brunt really quick. Um, today, Grady and Brunt employs about 21 million workers in every end of colonial claim and is vital to the continued restructuring and terraforming of the colonial home system other mining operations offer some local although trivial in reach 
competition, which we will get to uh, in a little bit later too. These include, oh, well, I guess we're gonna, we got them right here and I'm gonna botch the name so hard. Here we go. Antares Deep Space Resources, Pluto Rare Metals, Astro Mining Group, and the first Space Ventures Limited. Grady and Brunt, however, hold the sole contract for the demilitarized zone of Cluster 34. Demilitarized zone. This is the militarized zone that after the war was demilitarized. Hopefully that makes sense. Demilitarized zone, DMZ, otherwise abbreviated ad. An arrangement tolerated by, although not protected by, the Okar administration of the area. So I'm going to read this bit again because I kind of like broke it up a little bit. So let's let's unpack this. Grady and Brunt, Brunt own ownership over the demilitarized zone in Cluster 34. Like it's their property. And the Okar allow them to be there. After the negotiations, after the war, after making a peace treaty. The Okar said, okay... You can be here. And Gray and Brunt said, that's right, we can. And now they're starting all of these mining interests, which is why in Everspace One, you do not see Grady and Brunt being in conflict with the Okar because the Okar allow them. Okay? Good distinction. It also notes that the Okar do not protect Grady and Brunt. So that's why you don't see like a Grady and Brunt base. And then you see like a frigate and two... Corvettes buy it. That's not that's not the Okar's business. Grady and Brunt's got to protect themselves, which they can because they're a freaking monopoly and they have a lot of different resources and a lot of strengths and capabilities to uh, establish very powerful weaponry and defenses galore. So, uh, all of that being said, the concern utilizes private security to protect their interests in this case. So, boom, just what I was talking about. Crazy. Crazy, right? We have barely scratched the surface of what we're talking about here in the stream, okay? All of this that we're talking about is previous before you're even playing in Everspace. Mm. There's a lot to go by. So now, let's talk about the, the outlaws. Pluto's still a planet in this universe. No, it's... Isn't it a planet again? Somebody's gotta look that up. I thought, it, I thought we made it a planet again. Hmm. All right, so now we talked about Grady and Brunt. Let's talk about the outlaws and why they exist at all, okay? Because this is yet another faction, right? That um, that in Everspace One you're concerned about because they are definitely different from GMB. They're definitely different from the Okar, and we don't even know anything about the Colonials other than we're flying Colonial fighters. So the outlaws. Here we go. Oh, wait, I see an important question. Talon asks, is, oh. <laughs> Never mind. Not so much an important question, we just answer it. He basically asked if Pluto is still a planet. Goodness gravy. Anyway. Um, ja Jackson uh, Sukahara over on YouTube asks, Everspace 2 question, which is great. Let's go ahead and dive into this real quick. Can we customize the sound of our engine? That, uh, man, that's, that's a cool idea. I definitely encourage you to post that on the forums or in the Discord. Because uh, that would be really, that would be really cool. I like that idea a lot. I don't know, I don't know how much we would be able to uh like cover in that regard uh since obviously all the weapons are going to have different sounds so maybe there could be different sounds associated with certain modules um i could definitely see it as a strong possibility but but uh share that with others share that in the community so it'll be good that would be good outlaws so where did these guys originate from? Why are they here? Were they here prior to the wars? Did they show up afterwards? Well, let me tell you. The outlaw in, is the term used to describe unauthorized elements operating in the lawless fringes of colonial territories. Pretty self-explanatory here, okay? In Cluster 34, outlaw more specifically refers to the loose affiliations of warring clans, cartels, or gangs, which comprise of chiefly human, but also numerous alien species. 
So because it's primarily human, you've already put it together. I know that you have. After this huge war and the peace treaties were settled, there were a bunch of people that said, I'm going to be part of GMB and we're going to mine. And there were some people that were like, I'm going to be part of GMB and mine too, but I'm going to mine my own way. And so they branched off and instead of following the rules and the regulations of the sector, they do their own thing. And the outlaw, or excuse me, and the Okar, the Okar don't like that. So this is why you see the Okar and the Outlaws in constant conflict with one another within the bounds of Everspace One. It's all coming together. It's all coming together. But every single Outlaw you find throughout Everspace One is not in the same faction. They're not part of the same gang or mafia or whatever. You're actually duking it out with several different groups of Outlaws. You just don't see that from a gameplay level. Outlawism is primarily a human trait stretching far into its ancient history where they are known as bandits, marauders, and racketeers among a large variety of other terms. Some of which we're not going to say on this channel because we're trying to keep it as clean as possible. Nonconformist in nature and anarchic. And anarchic. And why can't I not say that word? You know exactly what it means. In terms. Nonconformist. Uh, excuse me. Where was I even... Nonconformist in nature and anarchic in organization, they traditionally pursue self-opportunistic purposes such as self-enrichment, although some choose this mode of lifestyle for the thrill of adventure alone. We're get, we're, we're, we got this. We got the knowledge. The demilitarized zone of Cluster 34 has become a magnet for those falling foul of the colonial authorities since its establishment following the peace treaty with the Okar. Boom, it's lining up and has drawn large numbers of fleet deserters, escaped criminals, and other desperados. That's a fun word. Each clan or cartel possesses its unique code of conduct. This might be important for another title. I'm going to read that one more time. Each clan or cartel possesses its unique code of conduct. And members are not unknown to switch allegiance when it is advantageous. Are not unload to switch allegiance when it is advantageous. Outlaws have been inventive in creating hideaways and unlikely crevices of unobscured space such as hollowed out asteroids and abandoned military bases. This actually shows why their rise to power, a lot of these outlaw factions, were able to exist and operate very well within the demilitarized zone. Since there was a war that broke out and everything was in disarray, it's ripe for the picking, including the military establishments that were made on the front lines of this conflict. After the conflict and peace treaty was settled, because the colonials could no longer operate there, they were abandoned. And the Okar, or the outlaw, excuse me, the outlaws just went ahead and swooped in and said, I'm going to call this my home. So now there's a bunch of little home bases. So now there's a bunch of little home bases around for all of these outlaw elements to just freely pick up and establish themselves as a means of a jumping point for how they operate, the people that they meet, and uh, going out and doing their thing. What do you mean I'm hitting at something? No, I'm not. Goodness gravy, stay on topic. All right. <clears throat> they make use of whatever plunder technology they can get their hands on and are prone to utilizing traps, stockpiles, heavy ballistic weaponry, and somewhere hit and run tactics. Of course, of course, of course. So this is a bit, another big component of this major conflict that has... You know, has already happened, like everything's already happened, but we have these growing outlaw forces, we have all of these Okar, which are kind of like a police force, but they don't protect. Then you have the GMB, which are just like filthy, greedy, I want more power, I want more resources, give me all dumb gains. And then you have the colonials. Oh, sorry, I should be using my props. And then you have and then you have the colonials all over all over the place outside of the DMZ. Like this is this is DMZ territory here. We'll go like this. So this is DMZ territory, right? And the colonials are like just hanging outside the borders, right? Just outside the borders. These, you know, nice little colonials. So colonials can't go in here. What would happen if a colonial went inside of here? Well, I think that there would be some conflict because that would be violating the peace treaties. So you wouldn't see, say, I don't know, a colonial warship in the DMZ. That would be really strange to see, wouldn't it? Something would be up if you saw some sort of massive vessel chasing you down. All 
Alright, let's talk about the Ancients briefly. This is going to cover a little bit more of the Okar. Oh, I got another question too. Another one from Jackson over on YouTube. I know that we'll be able to fly inside of big capital ships and destroy them from the inside, but can we do the same thing but with big space stations? Time will tell. Time will tell. We will definitely be showing content and making announcements for the various tasks and features that will be within Everspace 2. First, we gotta make it. But don't you worry, I think the stars are gonna align for you. All right, let's talk about the Ancients. The Ancients are believed to be a species which dwell in unexplored territories beyond Cluster 34. As yet not encountered in physical form by colonials, their existence is referred to often in dialogue with the Okar and evidenced by ruins and relics scattered throughout the cluster. Hmm. Stop eating the colonials, but they're so delicious! How about the GMB then? Can we eat some GMB? So what I think is really great about like the GMB is that like they all have like these super massive like mining uh, ships and transports, right? And you just like you're looking at that mining transport and you see all those goods inside and you're like, I want that. Oh my gosh, just call me an outlaw. Oh. Mmm. Mmm. Plasma mines. So ancient. As no living or dead ancient has yet been discovered, their genome has been impossible to isolate for further answers as to their origins. Excuse me. Mm. Woo. The Okar revere their knowledge and abilities and ascribe godlike qualities to them. Legend has it that they were once not dissimilar to the Okar species, supposedly reptil reptiloid but transcended matter through learning and meditation to become higher beings. The Ogar also attribute the ancients with vastly sophisticated technologies capable of feats unimaginable to colonial scientists. Many remain skeptical of the claims, however. So, what we just read here is that, like, the physical manifestation of these beings, these ancients, it hasn't actually been discovered yet. Nobody has seen them, but we have seen like their relics, their glyphs, their structures, and their protectors, if you will, of such things that are scattered about, but they're few and far and wide in between. It's, uh, it's not overly common to come across ancients, like, at all. In fact, some people go their entire lifespan without coming across an ancient. Mm. So, the ancients are kind of like Papa figure for the Okar. Alright? Ancients were here first, a long time ago. Then they kind of vanished. Okar showed up. Then Colonial showed up. Got it? Checking it out? Then whenever the Colonials showed up, conflict, de-escalation, peace treaties, outlaws. Okay? Clear as mud, right? Perfect. So now we, need, now we can actually start talking about some of these characters within all of these different happenings within the DMZ. Okay? I told you this is going to be a lore heavy stream. So we are we are going places. In fact, maybe it's better to talk about some places first. Did I get food on my screen? <laughs> it seems I got a little bit of colonial on my uh my monitor. All right. <clears throat> So let's actually talk about these places, because I think this is I think this is justified since we just talked about these factions. Then we'll get more into the characters. It'll be good. Mm. 
So, belt grade cluster. Cluster 34. Same exact thing. There's not a difference here. It's just called something different. This is particular... Uh, particularly used because of how like different species or races or factions uh, like identify with this area right some people call it the DMZ because their experience was very military or military it was combat oriented <clears throat> and others view this place as like a new home uh, away from everything else so they call it the belt of grades so that it doesn't sound as hostile, right? And some other people just don't really know too much about it. They're, it's more mysterious to them, so they just simply call it Cluster 34 because that's what it's labeled in all of the history books and the handouts that they receive, okay? So it's all the same thing. It's just called different based on one's perspective and background and all of that stuff. So let's talk a little bit more about the Beltagrades. Is the current limit of colonial expansion. So it's the furthest reaching point that the colonials have traveled to. Boo! Furthest point is the, the cluster 34, right? I won't eat that colonial. It was first mapped in the 24th century. And by the way, if anybody's like trying to like make a timeline, don't you worry. Grindel's got you covered. I'm actually going to pull that up in a little bit later as well. So first mapped in the 24th century, the first colonial unmanned expl exploration vessels did not arrive until the 30th. Okay? So it was mapped in the 24th century, but exploration vehicles didn't arrive until the 30th. That's a long freaking time to travel from one place to another after having it fairly mapped out and explored, right? So... Why is this? This goes back to what we started at the very beginning of the stream and how we are establishing ourselves away from like this real world application of, of locations and events. Like we wanted to make this our own playground and space, right? And the best way to do that is by putting as much distance in between real world stuff and us as humanly possible. So I think 600 years ought to do the trick. <laughs> So not only is it just ridiculously far away from Earth, but um, it takes a long time to get there too. <clears throat> to find an area rich in the resource required for terraforming the home system, blah, blah, blah. Early outposts constructed by mining concerns had limited contact with the indigenous Okar species. All right? So, so early outposts constructed by mining concerns, they basically showed up but there weren't any Okar, okay? And... So they started making mining and stuff and had very limited contact with Okar. Though hostilities later commenced with the arrival of the supporting colonial fleet, right? So basically, all of the, um, the, uh, um, the, like the, just the people who were wanting to live a new life, just the refugees we're gonna call them refugees that's probably not the right term basically just people who just want to live somewhere else they're the ones who actually got to cluster 34 first didn't really have too much conflict because they didn't shoot anything they didn't be they weren't aggressive they didn't look threatening but when the colonial fleet showed up that's whenever the okar flipped their table okay that's when the okar started firing back and everything just got nasty right everything just got crazy So today, the cluster is still resource-rich but infrastructurally ravaged by the conflict with the Okar. The demilitarized zone between Okar and colonial territories divides the cluster and maintains an uneasy peace. So, I want to show you guys a picture of what that looks like. So, one second. So, we talked about this um, through the Kickstarter. Um, that's a small picture. Hang on a second. I know I have a larger picture. Hmm. Where are you at?
Oh shoot, I can't seem to find it. All right, well, we're just gonna we're just gonna second hand this. It's fine. It's fine for now. So basically, what happened is that um, actually, I have an idea. One one more second. I got this because this is important. I want you guys to see. I want you to see the full thing here. Um, so we're gonna pull this up. Is it this one? Yes. Okay. So we have this. Uh, we have this world that is established uh, in the demilitarized zone. This is a screenshot. Cluster cluster thirty four is all in the middle here that you see. Okay. So you see like it goes from system 10, system 4, system 1, 2, 5, 7, 8, 3, 15. Um, then you have this area over here. This is the Okar Expanse. And you have that area on the left side. That is the colonial territories. Okay. So as you can see, like the Okar, where they exist, they're all like right here where my hand is. Right. So it's like this is all, this is all Okar territory on this side. Right. Whereas then like all the colonials. Man, carrots were a bad choice. Here, you know, we're going to use this because this is better. So then like, so basically like this, right? So you have the colonials over here and you have the Okar over here on those respective sides of this major demilitarized zone conflict, but have separated so that they're not all like in each other's business, basically, right? So that's why these borders were established. That's why the treaties were established. So that we weren't getting too crazy, where we weren't getting hostile with one another, um, but instead, like, saying these are our battle lines. We're not going to go through here. We're not going to do anything crazy. That's how it's all going to be. All right, cool. So now we can go back to to this. <clears throat> So you can see that like the demilitarized zone between Okar and colonial territories divides the cluster and maintains an uneasy peace. So that's that's what we were just looking at there. That's that separation. So now you'll see the demilitarized zone and where it started in the Beltagrades. Upon arrival in cluster 34 in the early 31st century, the colonials fleet the colonial fleet's first encounter with the equally matched Okar race proved disastrous, leading to all out conflict and widespread mutual destruction. If you've been paying attention in the stream, this should sound like stuff you already knew. This has put an abrupt halt to unchecked colonial expansion for the first time since it began. What does that mean? That means that since this conflict arised, whenever the trees were signed that said colonials can't be here. There were now groups of people, pockets of people that decided to just go expand anyway, even though the treaties said not to. People being bad. And thus it is unchecked colonial expansion. The current uneasy peace is upheld by the imposition of a demilitarized zone between the two factions. Boom, boom. We saw that in the picture. Administered and patrolled by the Okar, the territory's prior claimants. Colonial mining operations have been allowed to continue as part of the arrangement. Again, we've heard all of this before. GMB is allowed to be here. Okar is not going to conflict with them. But the Okar, at the same time, are going to make sure that nothing else happens to show up like colonials. Um, like I would, I would assume that if a colonial fighter just randomly found itself in the DMZ, they'd probably be getting shot down by Okar, probably being tracked down and chased down by them as well. You probably don't want to be a colonial fighter in the DMZ. Excellent. Let's talk about the Okar homeworlds. Look at this picture. Mm. The Okar homeworlds are a collection of nine, count them, nine inhabited desert planets on the outer edges of the Beltagrade cluster, which we saw already. The colonial diplomat missions, diplomatic missions, which arrived there in the mid 31st century, are the only humans known to have visited and formed the bulk of knowledge on their location, culture, and appearance. So in other words, it would be 
remarkably rare, if not impossible, to go see the Okar homeworlds and survive with some sort of story to share. The planets are sacred to the Okar and are shielded from long-range sensors. Okar are secretive about their customs and generally suspicious of all other species, although some interesting facts have been ascertained. Okar societies organized in a strict hierarchical structure in which roles, whether servant, warrior, or cleric, are established by birth. The exact origin of the species are still unknown and there is growing debate as to whether the Okar might be derived from a superior species beyond their domain, otherwise known as the Ancients. Seemingly incongruous writing and belief structures support this hypothesis. The Okar homeworlds are powered and sustained by a mysterious energy source referred to as Viridian Energy. So if any of you have uh, <coughs> seen any pictures of the DLC, uh, like the homeworlds at all, you'll have seen that big, huge, uh, massive crystal. Uh, I don't really have, I don't have a prop that could represent that. I'm sorry, guys. But basically, this, this massive green crystal, right? It looks like a, kind of looks like a pylon from a, a, a game that has crafts and star. In it, uh, and it's just like this massive viridian core that is literally powering an entire city below it. All right, so these this viridian energy source is ridiculously powerful. Okay, and it's what the Okar run off of. It is their fuel source, but it's also incredibly um, efficient and great for the environment. Wonderful. While some experiments have been conducted on this energy source, no colonial research has been able to stabilize it to date. I'm going to read that again because I know a lot of people have been wanting to customize their ship with Okar parts and pieces. <clears throat> While some experiments have been conducted on this energy source, no colonial research has been able to stabilize it to date. It's pretty final right there. All right. Further research into the field of study, however, has been prohibited by a stipulation in the peace treaty which was instanced, instanced upon by the Okar. Words are hard. So basically, research did happen, didn't really, didn't go well, and then um, it was kind of blocked by the Okar because they were like, quit, quit researching our tech. That's not, that's not nice. So that was basically cut off. The Colonials, the GMB, any even outlaws in order to like research any sort of okar tech you would have to like be really good friends with the okar somehow like that's that's like you're only in and nobody is we did start seeing a couple small pockets of okar that decided to be outcasts from their own societies like Tareen is an example of that Maybe we'll see more of that in Everspace 2, but I think the big thing to note is that these types of people aren't going to have the means of scientific discovery of these very powerful, rich, laden Okar artifacts. Just putting it out there so that you all understand how this is all lining up in this world. Okay, Colonial HQ. This is another big one. Mm. Woo! We have covered a lot of ground. This is really good. So let's talk about the Colonial HQ for a little bit. This place, and actually, wait. Do I have a picture for this one? No, it doesn't look like I do. That's fine. Colonial HQ. The Colonial Fleet Headquarters, Cluster 34. Did you read that? The Colonial Fleet Headquarters, Cluster 34. This is where the Colonials are established. Okay? Do we understand why, though? It's because we spent 600 years traveling across the stars to get here. We're not going back. <laughs> We showed up in full force, then got bullied, and now we're like trying to make a life of our own, right? So we established our headquarters where we ended up. So the Colonial HQ is here. 
It is here. Well, specifically, it's like over here, but like it's here. <laughs> so the colonial big bad bases are like here. The Okar big bad bases are like here. There's a lot of conflict going on. All of this is really strong groundwork for a story that we want to tell for a character trying to make a life and a living. All of these layers and details are important. All right, the Colonial Fleet Headquarters, Cluster 34, is a mega structure of facilitating, uh, facilitating all military operations for the frontier region. Completed in the aftermath of the war with the Okar, it is regarded as the strongest and most heavily defended colonial structure outside the Soul System. Woo! Beefy. All fleet movements are coordinated from the central control hub, and it is the seat of the local admiralty. Ad, ad, admiralty. Admiralty? Admiralty. Basically the bigwigs. Specific details of the number of craft, types of weaponry, or access points are not contained on the Eterna for security reasons. We'll talk about the Eterna as well. This is important. The base does, however, contain several bars and clubs and more than 20 fine dining establishments. There is also a sports venue and retirement gardens for fleet personnel to enjoy. So that's nice. That's nice. Nice setup. Admirable, admirable attempt to pronounce it. Oh my gosh. Why are words so hard for me today? You'd think that I have my words together when it's a, a lore-centric stream. Mm. Excellent. Do they have good Wi-Fi on that access point? Oh, it's the best. It is actually the... It's better than Earth's Wi-Fi. It's crazy. And do they still use uh, WEP security? <laughs> Talon, I like you. <clears throat> the, the best. The most refined. <laughs> all right. So now that we've talked about all of these places... We could get into, like, conversation about all these corporations. If you want to know more about the corporations, we can, like, breeze through it. That's not really my focus. This is more of, like, just, like, delicious lore as opposed to, like, really important lore. But, uh, long story short, um, several of these corporations were actually created by Kickstarter supporters, by the way. Fun fact. So they exist because it came out of somebody else's mind, not our own. It's beautiful. Glad to have that enveloped into our lore. Because now we can use stuff like this, right? Beautiful. Um, so let's go to these characters now. It is time. It is time to go to these characters. Let's talk about them. So right out of the gate, let's talk about Hive. Okay? A seemingly fan favorite of the entirety of this game. So what is the Hive? The Hive stands for Human Interface Virtual Entity, and it is a singular communication outlet of the Eterna system to which it belongs. Okay, so we saw that word Eterna again. We'll get there, don't worry. It is a standard installation in all colonial crafts and quarters. Hive interfaces are catered to its recipient, adopting a personality fitting to each attitude or projected relationship for the most efficient manner of communication. That means even like every single person has a hive, but the hive operates differently based on your personality, your expectations, the things that you have done and the things that you want to do. Like it changes. The hive varies based on those elements. How neat is that? Oh my goodness. So, Hive interfaces cater to its recipient, dog, person, blah, blah, blah. Not all Hives adapt in a cooperative manner, although they rarely become hostile to its user. So, they're not necessarily cooperative, but they don't become hostile. Alright. As part of Eterna, the Hive has full access to the entire compendium of the Colonial Knowledge Database. Wow. That's a lot of information. However, we'll only share what is permitted by rank or clearance of its user. Wow. That's like really restrictive. <laughs> the wider system is overseen by human controllers with a singularity switch for shutdown in the case of dangerous conclusions drawn from its computing power. 
So I'm just going to read that one more time because I do think that is important to note. The wider system is overseen by human controllers with a singularity switch for shutdown in the case of dangerous conclusions drawn from its computing power. Basically, if a hive or part of the Aeterna system is compromised, boom, is gone. It is eliminated on the spot with the flip of a switch because that cannot fall into the wrong hands. Very good. That is the hive. Who'd have thought that much power came out of such a wonderful uh, little buddy that we have in our spaceship? Tulol Tulameo says, Oof, as soon as Adam shows up outside Sector 7, hive gets yeeted. That's an interesting conclusion that you've come to. Let's talk about Adam. Who is this guy and what what do we care about him whatsoever? So we are almost, we have almost come to the beginning of Everspace 1, okay? That's how close we are. Here we go. Adam Rosslin was a chief science officer, not a fighter. He's a chief science officer of the Colonial Fleet. Born on Hector Delany Station in 2995, he was one of two children of renowned genetic researcher Dr. Kirk Rosslin and his wife Christine Rosslin. Showing tremendous aptitude for science, he was fast-tracked to the Fleet Academy where he planned to follow in his father's footsteps. He was notably shy and insecure with his comrades, which resulted in a difficult education. With the outbreak of war with the Okar, he was reassigned to Cluster 34 to lead the frontline cloning program for replacing pilots. <whistles> Boom! So this guy, uh, in all his science and knowledges, he was, he's the guy who was like engineering the clones and operating the cloning for the militarized colonial fleet, okay? The program came under widespread criticism from ethical bodies, however, and was discontinued at the end of the war as a stipulation of the peace treaty. Boom and boom. So clones, after the war, you're not supposed to make them. They are now illegal. Clones equal illegal. Got it? Clones are bad. Don't make them. Rosslyn was honorably discharged from the fleet during post-war mass demobbing, although is rumored to have remained in Cluster 34 without solid reassignment. We'll get to what happens in a little bit. Following several years of absence from public record, he is currently presumed missing or dead. We'll talk about that. It's fine. So this is, this is a character that is very important to you. <laughs> Very, very important. And we are going to be talking straight up spoilers here. And this is where the doors are really going to start opening wide because I'm going to assume you've seen the entirety of Everspace One's story. Okay? Because now we are inside of the game right here. You are a clone that Adam Rosslin has created. Okay? That's the starting point of the game. The reason your memory is all fuzzy and you're not really sure what's happening is because you're a clone. You're not some person who's been working a job and has a life and is putting things together and then now you're trying to figure out why you suddenly, your brain went AWOL. No, no, no. You're a clone. You basically start becoming operational and you're in a fighter pilot trying to figure out what you're doing and where you're going. That is the beginning of Everspace 1 right there. That is who you are and what you are trying to figure out. Okay? <laughs> Massive amount of artifacts? Oh no, that's not good. Yeah, if anybody's having any issues with the stream whatsoever, please let me know and I'll see if I can, uh, I can fix things. Should be good. All right. So that's Adam Rosslin. 
Uh, we will come back to him in a little bit. First, we need to talk about some other characters as well. Seth Nobu. Again, this is all like spoilers galore. So just you just got to be aware of that. Spoilers. All right. Seth Nobu is an active outlaw. He's an active he's an active outlaw and former lieutenant of the colonial fleet. Okay? Who was discharged without honors at the end of hostilities with the Okar. He was born on the uh, Ganymede station? Uh, basically near Jupiter in 3002 to Captain Jackson Nobu and medical officer Sarah Nobu. He was the 11th generation of Nobus to have enlisted for service, securing him an automatic place in the Fleet Academy. Intelligent but short-tempered, he often fell foul of academy rules, although proved himself to be especially skilled as a fighter and a leader, earning the respect of his peers and swiftly gaining rank. Assigned to the front lines at the outbreak of war with the Okar, his unconventional techniques garnered him much success on the field of battle, many decorations, and a considerable reputation among the troops. All of this, however, was to be marred by his confrontational attitude to senior staff, which ultimately led to his dishonorable discharge at the end of the Okar conflict. Nobu remained in the demilitarized zone where he has profited from illegal trade with outlaw elements and transport of contraband. He is currently sought by authorities and regulation to a missing fleet property and suspicion of involvement in a number of attacks on goods convoys. He has been difficult to trace and is believed to be protected by mercenary squads. Something that it actually doesn't list in here is that he was also found dealing with clones. Oh my gosh. So yeah, this is actually within the story itself. Oh, thanks for the follow. I appreciate it. Um, so this is also within the story itself through um, through some, one of the flashbacks actually is that... Um, Seth, when he was dealing with uh, with outlaws, he was like, well, I, I know a guy who knows how to clone, so I'm going to join up with him to do some dirty deeds. And so he joins up with Adam, and Adam's like, okay, I guess I can do this, and they get caught. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Next, let's talk about... Uh, let's talk about Denara next. Initially, yes, it took 600 years to get to Cluster 34. You are correct, Tulul Tulameo. After the 600 years of the um, the transports, like the the initial fleet, for the uh, colonial forces, they did not take long. It was far more optimized. It only took a little bit of building of the jump gates established within the demilitarized zone, and then the colonial fleet was like, zoink, we're here. So it took a long time initially, but once you got all those jump gates and ports established, no time at all. Good question. Very good question. All right. <clears throat> so now, um, actually, let's take a break. We've been we've been talking about a lot of lore. It's it's been pretty heavy. We're really starting to get into like all of this conflict, uh, a conflict, and how like your story matters in Everspace One, and what that's going to shape and look like in Everspace Two. So let's take a quick break. I'm going to go get some more water, maybe some more food, and um, we'll start back up in like a couple minutes, okay? So stretch, get relaxed, think about some things that I said, maybe ask some questions, and uh, we'll be right back. Also, of course, this is uh, always a great time to follow us on Discord, share your thoughts and ideas. Uh, also, poke us over on Twitter, and of course, watch us on Twitch, or YouTube, or Mixer, or Steam, however you like. I will see you all in a few. One moment.
Ooh, okay, we have returned, and I'm sure that some of you have been bubbling with some new questions based on what our discussion has been about. So I'm actually going to um, answer one thing that I know that Tulo Tulameo is probably going to be like, um, oh, actually, I see the question. So it would be possible to visit the soul system. So I'm going to explain why that's not actually possible. So check this out. So basically, um, whenever the colonials jumped in, uh, so basically, okay, so this is what happens, right? So your colonials, like before the warships, right, you actually just had like your your poultry little um, poultry little peasants, okay? We're going to... We're going to call them blueberries, okay? You had your blueberries, right? They show up to, uh, after 600 years, they show up to cluster 34, right? So they show up to cluster 34, and they build a warp gate, okay? The, it's, it's, it's dark, it's black, it's bleak. I forgot that this was green and this wouldn't work. Here, let me try again. A warp gate. They build a warp gate, okay? So it's very mysterious. You can, it's like you can see right through it. Can we do it? You can see right through it because it's a portal to another location, right? So the blueberries build this warp gate, right? Blueberries build the warp gate. <clears throat> After they build the warp gate, there was a warp gate that was obviously built in um, at, at Earth, right? So that they could connect to one another. Don't mind the fact this is green. There's a, there's a warp gate here, okay? You see it? So there's, a, there's two connecting warp gates, and that's how... The colonial fleet went boop, boom over to cluster 34 very quickly. So then there was a conflict, right? And this warp gate, because there's a conflict, you don't want this you don't want this point of origin to go back to your homeland. So this was either deactivated or destroyed in some capacity, right? Breaks the chain, the link over to this warp gate. Now it doesn't end there, okay? So now this warp gate that's at Earth cannot be reached so earth goes there's something wrong with this warp gate and they decommission it because they don't know what's going on in cluster 34 everything's just out everything's lost and they know that there's no more connection to a warp gate so they decommission this so then after that warp gate's unestablished at earth they're like okay well we're going to build our warp gate over here in cluster 34 again and we're going to reestablish a connection with earth Except there's nothing here. There's no way to go home. <laughs> this is no longer connected. So if they want to reestablish that connection, it's going to be 600 years back to Earth. Not going to happen. <laughs> so this is why these, these two different sites are now disconnected and everything is operating independently inside of the, cl the cluster, inside of cluster 34, the Beltagrades, and is completely disconnected from Earth. Even though the Aeterna system, it definitely has knowledge of Earth and all of its systems and all of the processes and all of this type of stuff that we have at our disposal, um, but we can't get there, we can't jump. So communication's a bit of a problem. Transportation's a bit of a problem when it comes to the demilitarized zone, when it comes to cluster 34 and the bounds of Earth, okay? So that is how and why there's a disconnect there. All right, suspicious looking blueberries, but they're delicious. Mm. All right, so I wanna get that out of the way. Stupid of them. Dude, if you were, if you, if you showed up and started getting attacked by aliens, okay, and you didn't want your entire species to be eradicated, would you destroy the means that that would be possible with? Or would you just be like, ah, lol, it's fine, we got beat, so they can go and destroy the rest of us? What would be your, what would be your decision? I'm just curious. <laughs> And you have to think tactically like a military officer. <laughs> Regardless, these were the decisions that were made by the colonial persons and the fleet and how it all operated. So now they are essentially cut off. That's what happened. Independence Day. 
All right. So, uh, so we talked a little bit about Seth Nobu here and how he's uh, apparently like some sort of outlaw. So, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people like, yeah, smash it, destroy it, cut your losses. Okay. Yep. My kingdom for a hyper hyperdrive shunt. Oh my gosh. Send nukes. <laughs> I like that response. Nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. All right, let's talk about Dinar Roslin. We're making really good progress. This is good. We're actually getting ready to start talking about Everspace 2, believe it or not. Believe it or not. So, um, I should say before I start getting back into this, for anyone who's just shown up, who's like enjoying the lore stuff, um, yeah, so heavy spoilers. Really heavy spoilers. So, Dinar Roslin is a freelance pilot operating in the Beltagrade Cluster. Born on Hector Deloney Station in 3016, she is one of two children, renowned genetics researcher Dr. Kirk Roslin and his wife Christine Roslin. This should sound familiar because this is Adam Roslin's sister, Denara. <clears throat> Denara Roslin completed her training basic training at Fleet Academy and is highly proficient with in interceptors. However, she did not pursue a fleet career and now works protecting interstellar trade convoys. So that's all the more we know about her. She was just uh, hanging out protecting things and people and of her own volition because she's a freelancer. So throughout the adventure of Everspace One, she probably in some capacity discovered that her brother uh, was captured because he was doing something illegal, she probably would want to help him out. We'll talk more on that in a moment. Now it's time to talk about some big beef, big spoilers. First Admiral Kryn Gork is a leading figure of the Colonial Fleet, currently in command of seven capital ships and some 128,000 personnel in Cluster 34. That is a large number in Cluster 34. Born on Ganymede Station in 2975, he became a ward of the fleet at the age of eight. Following the loss of his family during an alien attack on their transit to Cluster 17. Completely different location. Other aliens attacked and they were, they were destroyed. To aid him through the trauma of loss, he was placed in a Zen monastery in Ulaanbaatar, where his he spent his formative years studying alien archaeology and displaying little interest in meditation or the monastic life. So basically, he doesn't like aliens. His talent for alien languages led him to decrypt the Shin Yu artifact at the age of 18, an accomplishment which made his name in scientific circles and gave colonial diplomats a key edge in adverting a catastrophic war with the Phobi. Gork enlisted with the fleet to broaden his horizons and open the possibility for new learning, although rumor that some of his family were still alive may have been a motivating factor for his decision. He rose quickly through the ranks and became Admiral by the age of 43, a record for the fleet. He is credited as being a peacemaker, although also noted for his hot-headedness in high-stress situations. This behavior may have led to his biggest blunders during the war with the Okar, when his division suffered the heaviest losses on the field of battle. Ouch, town. Population. Gork. Having lost face, he argued with the fleet council repeatedly to eradicate the Okar threat by any means necessary, but was broadly outvoted. Despite the council recommending his reassignment to a separate cluster, he remains in cluster 34, close to the area of his greatest defeats, ostensibly to continue research into artifacts of the ancient civilization in the area. Woo! So... Who is this guy and why is he so significant? Basically, he doesn't like aliens. He lost during the Okar colonial conflict, but he's still an admiral and he's still in the area. He's probably scheming. Probably trying to do something dirty. Probably. And we'll get to that in a short while as well. There's a lot of these things that are just going to come boop, near the end of this stream. And y'all's just going to be like, what? So now let's talk very briefly about some of these other characters. These are all 
characters that only show up if you are if you own the DLC. These are characters that don't necessarily impact the storytelling of the the game. Rather, they add a lot of flavor to it. So let's talk about some of them because it's fun. Tareen. Oh my gosh, Caden, I just read your comment. That was good. All right, so Tareen. Tareen is the name of an Okar lone operator in the DMZ who has been encountered and identified by numerous outlaw sources. A lone Okar is an extremely rare occurrence. Remember when we were talking about the Okar and talking about how like societally they were like all very bound together and very like permanent to where they go? An Okar by themselves is not something you see like ever. Okay, so Tareen's a very special case here. Since they are understood to be, uh, I actually don't know that word, eusocial? Is that, is that what, basically operating all like together, right? And herd-like, thus terrain has been marked for further but distant observation by fleet scientists. Terrain operates as a trader in the DMZ and appears to have many contacts with the ability to source powerful weapons and bulk resources. He has so far not been observed to return to the Okar homeworlds. Basically, he's an outcast and is therefore thought to be a kind of outcast. Oh, boom. <laughs> Those who have done direct business with him have reported him to be uh, amib amiable but reserved and only interested in making trade. As such, despite regularly handling and trading illegal goods, he is regarded as a relatively harmless oddity of the DMZ. So this guy basically operates and profits to his liking with whom he desires. And he's an Okar. It's a very strange case. But he's fun. We like him, we think. Oh, uh, thanks for that, Don Hugh Goduku. Goduko? Doku? Your words? Words are hard. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. And also, Mr. Jox Joxar. That's pretty funny. Um, Excelsior, I am not. Maybe I am? That name seems familiar. I'm not sure. Alright. So that's Tareen. Let's go to Maurice. Oh, my boy Maurice. NRAPS4210 is a search and destroy android with proper observational personality registered to Gradient Brunt Prospects. Basically, he's a bounty droid for the GMB. Built in 2990 at the Advanced Bionics Institute and previously employed as a test pilot, his currently primary function is to find and eliminate threats to GMB's operations in the demilitarized zone. Prior to its last dispatch, after maintenance, NRAPS 4210 downloaded some unconventional material of unknown origin, and for this reason it has been flagged for checkup. Despite some unconfirmed reports of the android referring to itself as Maurice, servicing has been delayed as it is performing its duties and, ex ex and executing warrants beyond any expectation. So for you guys who know the story of Maurice, basically, um, that's hilarious. For those of you who don't, this guy uh, downloaded a pay-to-win video game, a mobile, mobile game on his computer, and the way that he funds himself doing it is he has other people collect bounties for him, he gives them a cut, and then he uses the other part of the bounty to fuel his game that he's playing. Okay? So he's like the best player of this game that he has on his ship, and nobody else can like challenge him. <laughs> he's amazing. I love Maurice so much. So the reason why his duties are being executed uh, beyond any expectation is because he's just hiring a bunch of people to do them for him. <laughs> All he does is play video games. Maester Throng. Maester Throng is a male Gnos from Kodo 5. Kodo 5. Hmm. I feel like I've seen that somewhere before. He, like many among his amphibian-like species, is a scientist and is currently engaged on a research mission in the DMZ. The Gnos 
are known for their highly inquisitive attributes and are often encountered in far-flung parts of the galaxy, seeking new knowledge to take home in order to impress their scientific circles and attain prestige. They are a mild-mannered and affable species, while they have a very unusual history. Initially bred as test subjects to a more dominant sp species on their home planet, they rapidly evolved themselves and turned the tables on their captors, which they now use as their test subjects. What? What? That's right. These guys were bred by another species, and now they control the species that bred them. Woo! Their vast accumulation of stored knowledge has caused some concern among other races in the galaxy as to its purpose, though the Nos are not considered a threat. Pretty crazy. All right. Any more updates on Everspace 2 in April? Oh, there will be plenty of updates uh, in April. <laughs> we just have to wait for April. Ha! But yeah, don't worry. We're going to have a lot. But all this lore, I really hope that you guys are soaking in this lore. Because this lore is going to be important for things that are going to be happening in the future. It's really, really important. Alec! Alec is the name of a male Horag outlaw. Horag. That is what I said. It's the name of a male Horag outlaw operating in the DMZ. Um, he operates under the faction of the Coalition. You can actually see it on the banner back there. So this is kind of a, a distinction point that not all the outlaw just work together. Like some of them work in tandem with like certain packs and groups. Okay, so he is part of the Coalition. <clears throat> Nothing is known of his exact origins, but it is believed that due to his small stature and furry appearance, he was captured and listed on the black market as an exotic pet before being freed by outlaw raiders. To a little to Lameo, I think we had a conversation about this earlier, but there it is. Now you know. He was being sold on the black market. <laughs> Yikes. As a pet. He has since become extremely loyal to the clan which rescued him, the Coalition, and has rapidly ascended its ranks. Probably because he got a little bit of assistance. <clears throat> the list of crimes attributed to the Coalition is ever-growing, although Alex seems to be more involved in strategic planning of operations and rarely gets involved directly in firefights himself. Since joining the clan, Alec has married five times and now has a sizable brood, which he is raising to follow in his footsteps. Woo! Wow. Alec, my boy. Last person of significance to talk about. Carly Michelle Sharp is a female human freelance agent employed by GMB and the DMZ. She was born on Earth in 3031 to Gerald Hughlin Sharp and Constance Madison Hightower. After achieving a degree in astrogeology, she went off planet in 3052 to pursue an engineering career. With family funding, she developed and perfected a process of ore extraction called sharpening, a more efficient ways of retrieving quantities of ore from asteroid fields. In a patent loose lawsuit in 3056, however, she claimed that the process was pilfered by a gradient brunt spy, Hortensio Hawkins. Sharp lost the case and was left with crippling legal fees. Hawkins was later discovered murdered and mutilated and Sharp was questioned at length by authorities. Although no charges have been brought, she is still considered a person of interest in the case. Damn. Despite the spat with GMB, she took employment from them during basic maintenance in the DMZ while she attempts to settle their debts. A GMB spokesperson has expressed the corporation's commitment to helping the young and talented Sharp establish herself as an engineer. Woo! Never cross an angry miner. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so she's definitely got a history too. So why why are we talking about all of these people? So the reason why we needed to talk about all of these people is to talk about the clone that you play as through Everspace One. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to be going through all of the flashbacks. I'm going to turn up the audio so you can hear because I don't think it's going to have captions. Okay? And we're going to go through them all in sequence. This is actually really important for the story so that you can see them all together and understanding where you fit into this grand picture of all of these other characters, okay? So I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, spoilers, 
So let's get in to the flashbacks. The first spawn. Here we go. Something's not right with me. I'm having memory loops. There was a dispute. I was standing in the way of their plans. I was restrained. Shot with something. Who is this? I managed to escape. That's all I can remember. I must find some answers. So that's where you are mentally at at the very start of the game. When you launch your ship, those are all flashbacks from your original, from Adam Rosslin. Something went down. Let's figure out what those details were. Strange. Fragments of memories. Trying to make sense of them. I had managed to escape. I was weak and ill. My cells were deteriorating. A deadly poison. A cytotoxin. A slow, relentless, eating me away. There was a way to halt its progress, but it would take time. All I could do was set the wheels in motion. Await the outcome in stasis. A long, uncertain sleep. So these are important to note that these are flashbacks of your original, okay? These are not your like personal accomplishments and things that you've done like this is what adam did and they're stuck in your mind okay sounds really trippy but you're remembering these things the further you progress as you play the game so here's the next one that we remember as we're getting ever closer to this location that we are tasked to go to as this clone my memories are not my own they are copies they originate from someone else. It was at the Fleet Academy. His name was Adam. Adam Rosslin. Quiet, reserved, awkward around the others. He had a friend, Seth. They shared a dorm. Basic training was tough. Seth looked out for Adam. He stood up for him. The brains and the brawn. They became close like a team. And then the orders came. Deployment for war against the Okar. Alright, so now we're seeing that both Nobu and Adam, uh, they were actually bunkmates. They were friends, right? And um, this has like come to a peak where now they're assigned to go duke it out with the Okar. This is the Okar colonial conflict that happens right here, right now, and Adam and Seth are on the front lines, right? We talked, we already talked about this a little bit with his biography and that he was a scientist, right? Let's get into that a little bit deeper. They arrived at Cluster 34 into a cauldron of hellfire. A war of unprecedented intensity. Seth Nobu was an ace fighter, earning his badges quickly in combat. Adam Rosslin was on the same carrier, cloning new troops for the front. The war was mutually devastating, but mercifully short. With an armistice, the fleet had to withdraw. But some wanted to stay behind for the spoils, new opportunities. Seth Nobu was among this group. Adam Rosslin went with the fleet. Complying with the peace conditions, 
His cloning program was dissolved. All of these things are very important, right? So we see that Seth actually chooses to become one of these outlaw elements, right? He seeks opportunities abound, whereas the Colonials legitimately, like, go beyond the reach of the demilitarized zone and then establish their HQ, right? Colonials go establish their HQ and then all of these Okar, including Seth, or outlaw, excuse me, all these outlaw, including Seth, decide they're going to do what they want, as they will. Right for the picking, they think. But Adam complied with fleet orders. The cloning programs were dissolved, right? And he's like, okay, I'm going to just go B. I'm going to not going to deal with any of this mess anymore. Boom. So now we get into what I was alluding to a little bit before and like how Adam and Seth get into some serious trouble. Here we go. Reconstructing Cluster 34 would be an enormous task. Logistics for this new frontier were key. Seth Nobu had worked hard to build his business. He had the prestige, the contacts, and he greased every palm along his path. He was soon the biggest weapon supplier around, artfully circumventing the treaties. He had a simple reason for seeking out Adam Rosslyn again. Demand for illegal human clones. Adam needed some convincing. He had doubts. But in the end, the friendship held. And a deal was struck. So Seth got Adam in trouble. Basically, over a couple of brewskis. <laughs> hey, I want you to make a couple of clones because I know you're good at them. I don't know about that. Have another drink. It's totally fine. Just a little sippy step. It's totally great. And I was like, all right, this is the last time. One batch of clones. That's it. And then I'm done. I'm not really down for this type of shenanigans. Oh my goodness. The Nameless John asks, is this game out yet? Uh, yes, actually, the we're reviewing the lore of Everspace 1, and then we're going to be talking about Everspace 2 here shortly. Grindel, how's it going? Oh my goodness. This is fun. This is fun. All right, so after this dubious deal, uh, what happens from there? Now, I want you to remember about that Kryn Gork fellow, right? I want you to remember about everything about Adam and, and Seth and all this stuff, okay? This is important. Now it's coming, like... Coming to, like, it's all making sense here, okay? It was only a matter of time before their illegal cloning venture was uncovered. The colonial authorities apprehended them during a raid. They were resigned to see out their days on a penal base. But there was one in the high command with different plans for them. Colonial Fleet Admiral Kryn Gork. What? He offered amnesty in return for their cooperation on a covert project. He needed Seth's facilities and Adam's expertise for decrypting the Okar genome. And he wanted it done in secret. The offer was preferable to a prison moon. So what do we know about this Kringort guy? We knew that he does not like the Okar. We know that he actually despises the Okar. And he's just existing, basically, because he's not allowed on the front lines anymore since the peace treaties. But he catches Seth and Adam, and he knows that Adam is a brilliant scientist, because he caught them doing these clones. And Seth is just a scumbag, and that's fine. Whatever. Right? So Kryn Gorks found them. Now let's see what happens. Adam Rosslyn succeeded in decrypting the Okar genome. The Admiral was satisfied with the work they had done. Now he could progress to the next stage of his plans. Using the decrypted genome, he wanted to create a brigade of Okar clones to incite fresh conflict between the races. Oh my gosh! With a new war, he could finally defeat the Okar and establish colonial supremacy in the cluster. The Admiral offered them a part in his scheme, with all its privileges for their ongoing cooperation. Seth Nobu accepted the offer. Done. Adam Rosslyn would not stand for reviving a war. 
He refused to take any part in it. That looks familiar. But the Admiral had more crude methods of persuasion. Injecting Rosslyn with a controlled cytotoxin. Rosslyn was given no choice but to comply. Nobu made no objection. His interests were clear. So you can see how this story has come full circle now. Right? So the original Adam. This original Adam. He did, he, he did a bad thing. Got caught. Then he was going to be given amnesty if he did another bad thing. He did another bad thing. And then he was like, okay, well, now you're going to help me with this scheme. And Adam said no. And this is when he gets injected with the cytotoxin, being forced into doing this thing. So Adam is now basically being controlled. And if he doesn't do what he's told, he's just going to get killed. And Seth's like, I'm down. Friendship. <laughs> Becoming an outlaw really, uh, really changed Seth. And Adam just really didn't want to have anything to do with any of this. He's just got thrown into it, right? So now let's see what happens when he is forced to do this line of work for Kryn Gork. And essentially creating Okar clones. To make a fresh rebellion and establish a new Okar colonial conflict. Betrayed by Seth Nobu, Adam Rosslyn worked under guard in his captor's laboratory. The cytotoxin was killing him slowly. The Admiral held the antidote. Rosslyn's only options were work or die. But he devised his own solution to the problem. Copying all incriminating data and destroying the research, he made his move. find a cure. So he fled to somewhere he had worked before. A secret lab in the militarized zone. So Adam escapes the clutches of Kryn Gork and Seth and decides to hide. So he does this by flying to Sector 7, is what it's called, where there's a secret colonial base where you can hide and figure out a cure. Okay? Next. This one's really, really, really important. Because this one is going to help us understand why we exist as a player character. Okay? Pay attention very closely. Really, really closely. After a painful voyage, Adam Rosslyn finally reached the secret lab. His DNA code was recognized by the defense system. To his shock, the entire facility had been made unusable. Time was running out. But there were other cloning facilities. Carriers, abandoned bases, scattered throughout the demilitarized zone. Too far to reach. Remotely, he brought one of them back online, initiating an exploit protocol. If the plan worked, it would bring him a body replacement. In his fever, he made mistakes. But the wheels were set in motion. In the meantime, the cryo chamber would halt the cytotoxin's progress. A long, uncertain sleep. So, holy cow major spoilers here but essentially what this is saying is that when the original adam reached sector seven to hide he was like i'm dying like he's he's got this fever like he's just he's not operating well he's trying to figure out a way to save himself right and his only option now oh, excuse me that, that music's kind of loud <clears throat> his only option now is to like basically get a body replacement like replace his mind into a new body okay like we're talking like really crazy sci-fi stuff so he starts looking for cloning facilities and there's like none that are nearby none of them the closest one is in sector one that's the start of our journey here folks he turns on this cloning facility makes some mistakes in how it's supposed to operate how it's supposed to function right and so 
there are a couple of stipulations made by Eterna and the Colonials whenever clones are made, especially for mo war, and that is that they do not have memories. They don't know who they are, so they serve one function, and that is to go fight on the battlefield and basically die. They're expendables. They also have a timer on their lives, so they don't live very long either. We'll get to that in a moment as well. All of these things in place, Adam's like, well, that doesn't matter to me. I just need a body replacement. That's all I need. I just need a body replacement. And he sets the wheels in motion, as it says. And this cloning facility in Sector 1 starts spitting out clones. And that's you playing the game. You are clone number one. You're trying to figure out what you're doing, where you're going. You're getting all these memories coming back. Full circle. So you're trying to get to Sector 7 to give Adam a body. So you're not a person. You don't, you don't matter to anybody. You are just a tool for somebody else to survive. Except, except you're growing and your knowledge and understanding of things and you're developing your own sort of take on everything. And it's not so transparent as to you just being a bag of flesh. There's a lot more to it than just that. You're actually becoming your own type of person. So at the very end of the game, well, almost at the end of the game, we actually run into ourselves, if you will. The clone, when you complete your first run in the game, you meet Adam Rosslyn. Something has changed. These are my memories. I made it inside the hangar. There was Nobu, lying injured by the defense system. He was still alive, barely. I had so many questions, but didn't know where to start. He fixed me with his gaze. Then he laughed, mocked me. He seemed crazed, rabid with pain. In that moment, I didn't know whether to hate him feel compassion for him. I had to make a decision. In the end, I realized that to start the next chapter of my story, his story had to end. With Nobu dead, my DNA was validated by the system. I was led to the lab. There he was, Adam Rosslyn, my original, waking from stasis. We looked at each other for a long time. It was a moment of reckoning. And we talked, perhaps for hours. Rosslyn was filled with remorse, heavy with regret. He seemed to realize that I was not just a dull clone. He admitted his plan was ill-constructed. What was expected was a body replacement. What arrived was a person, a thinking, feeling being. Roslyn had reached the end of the line. My lifespan was limited too. The clone sequencing he initiated had left me flawed. There was a chance for me to carry on, but not Roslyn. So he instructed me in what to do. With the missing DNA fragments, I could use the lab's transfiguration pot and make myself complete. He showed me how to localize the fragments on the star map. Out of stasis, it didn't take much longer for the cytotoxin to finally do its work and kill Rosslyn. I had much to do. There were new possibilities, though time was limited in my current iteration. I needed a fresh body, and there was only one way to get it. Boom. So... Oh, Gordon Lynn actually really asked a really good question. So we do need to wrap up a, a little bit more lore um, first, and then we'll continue the storyline, because we're not done, even though that's all the flashbacks. So, Gordon Lynn asked, did we mention Adam Sisler? This is actually really important. So, when you are flying from Sector 1 to Sector 7 as a body replacement for Adam, who's waiting there for you, Denara actually shows up from time to time to help you, because she's trying to help her brother, Right? She doesn't necessarily have the full understanding of it. She just knows that as a clone, 
you know where you're going, so she's going to help you get you there. And then by following you, she's going to find her brother, right? So she does that. Um, you get to Sector 7. You run into Seth, in fact, and Seth, like, discovers you're a clone. He's like, oh, my gosh, well, you're not who I'm looking for. I'm looking for Seth. Uh, Seth, what have you done? Uh, or, excuse me, Adam. Adam, what have you done? He's, like, thinking, what in the world? There's all these clones now trying to find Adam. This is ridiculous. So this all, when you get to Sector 7, Dinara is trying to bust in and take out Seth, and Seth actually kills Dinara. Dinara is just wiped off the table. She's just gone. And then Adam is trying to, excuse me, the clone is trying to fight in to find Adam, whereas Seth is also trying to break in. So the reason why in that flashback Nobu was at the, the, at the doors and he was dying is because he was trying to bust in and the defense system shot him. Ha! You'd think with his military expertise, he would have known that trying to bust into a military facility, you're gonna get got. But no, he was, he knew that outside the clone was duking it out with all of his uh, assailants. And he just needed to get at him and he got, he got got. So whenever the clone does go into this facility, he sees Nobu sitting there, basically bleeding out. Kills him so that the DNA validates his system to go and to meet the original Adam. So Dinar has been killed, Nobu's been killed, and Adam dies. But not before showing the clone, you, how to make yourself whole. So this is actually really, really important because in the late game of Everspace, you actually have to obtain DNA fragments, okay? Um, now one second, because I do need to pull up a video to show a little bit of this. It's important. Whoop. I'm going to find it. Hang on. Now, one moment, we are going to jump on over to, uh, to a little bit of replay here. But this is actually really important to the storyline. So what we're doing is we're going into a recap of the story itself, much like we are talking about. And after, um, after, after the clone kills himself to get a fresh new body, boom, warp him back in. Now, he has discovered that he has to collect these DNA fragments from other clones. So what, what this means, there, there's two parts of this, really, what it means. The first part is that, um, so we're not the only clone that was pumped out of this facility. There are actually multiple clones that exist at the same time, and they're all trying to get to Sector 7. So that probably wasn't intentional from Adam's part. And the second thing is that the only way to make ourselves whole is by getting the DNA sequences of these other clones. So now you have to go fight yourself, and whichever clone gathers all the DNA first essentially completes himself. So, Hive, looks like we'll be spending more time together. I presume there have been further developments? I need to source a series of DNA fragments to override the time limit on my body. I need your help. Strange that you should choose mortality over an endless supply of clone copies. I can't handle the constant resets forever. I want a new start, a real start, and a long life. I can empathize to a degree. To be in control of your own destiny. Yeah, you got it. Let's start looking for those fragments. So this is a process of what looking for them. What we are seeking them. is in the craft ahead. It appears to be another clone. Another you. This is too weird. What are the chances to listen to reason? As much as you are capable of reason, unpredictable. Hey, identify yourself. You're not gonna like this. What the? No, no, this is, this is a trick. This iteration has not been active long. I hope this is not too unsettling for you, but you should take definitive action. You need that DNA to survive. I'll have to do this the hard way. It's too risky otherwise. It can only be one of us to make this work. A 
According to the coordinates, there should be a DNA... Alright, so as you can see, like, now you're going through and you have to basically destroy these other clone copies of yourself to get the rest of the compiled DNA to make yourself whole again. Because there's each of these different fragments of your DNA that exist being pumped out of this cloning facility. So they're, they're slightly different clones from one another. So you're not like from the same pool of clones getting launched from Sector 1 trying to get to Sector 7. And now you have to find eight other of those clone pools to gather one energy, uh, one DNA from each one of them to put yourself back together. Wah! Wah! Yeah, it's friggin' bonkers. Okay? So... Uh, the big thing about all of this is that once you do end up getting all of this DNA, you're probably kind of wondering, what, so, like, what happens after after all of that goes down? All right, this is it. Let's get in there and get me fixed. So now we are in Sector 7, and it's time to plug in all the DNA so that we can survive. Right? Right? So what now? It seems a little anticlimactic. I don't feel any bit different. Actually, I want to play a different video here. Because this is this is funny. Um hang on one second. This is we're going to we're going to do this real quick because I want to show um uh, I want to show a clip of another character that I was watching uh live stream of and had a lot of fun in his stream. Um and this was this was really great. He actually completed the full game. Uh, pretty quickly, um, pretty proud of him, it's pretty awesome stuff. He goes by Teradyne Online, and I just wanted to show this clip uh, because it's it's pretty freaking awesome. So, what now? so this is him reaching this part in the game and just seeing his response uh, just because it's fun, okay? So this is Teradyne Online, giving him a little shout out. Uh, I love... I love watching you guys playing Everspace, so if you are out there playing Everspace, I'll probably show up in your stream. I might ev not even tell you who I am. Uh, it's fun. So here we go. So what now? It seems a little anticlimactic. I don't feel any bit different. What we have accomplished is correcting the DNA sequence conveyed to the clone factories. This simply means all subsequent iterations will have normal lifespans. Oh. So after all that, I've still got a timer on me. I'm condemned to die? Yes. I had assumed that you had ascertained as much. I Bummer. had a feeling it wouldn't be so easy. Oh. Whoa, what the... <laughs> I just love his expression there. He's just like, oh! <laughs> so basically, after, comp after compiling all of that DNA, <clears throat> now we are to this part where this big warship shows up who do you think's on the warship? Is it A, Denara, B, Alec, C, a bunch of monkeys, or D, Admiral Kryn Gork? Whoa, what the? Occupant of craft, take a good look at me. Do you know who I am? It's him. It's you, from my memories. Yes, I, I know who you are. Admiral Gork. Your business was with Adam Rosslyn, not with me. So basically, Gork shows up and he's like, um, no. You see, I had this master plan to, to arrange this entire battle between the Okar and the Colonial, and you're messing everything up. I have been trying to stop you from moving through this entire cluster because I found out that you're a clone. I can't figure out where the cloning facility is, but I've been tracking you down. I've been sending colonial warships that I have manufactured sneaking into the bounds of the DMZ, even though that it's against the treaties, just to bring you down because you know of my plans. The gameplay mechanic of this operates where you're on a timer, and if you don't leave soon enough, not only the Okar show up to take you down, but so do Grin Cork's warships. He is the one hunting you down. He is the one trying to stop you from getting your knowledge out there so that he would get found out. Because he doesn't want to be dishonorably discharged or killed. You have knowledge against him, and that's why he's trying to stop you right here, right now. So in this confrontation with Gork, it, it, uh, it'd take way too long to watch all of this videos because we're like almost done with the stream. Basically, 
Uh, long story short, it ends in a fiery blast of goodness where uh, he he doesn't bode well. So we'll jump ahead like this. Face it, Gork. You lost. It's over. If there is one consolation, it's over for you too. The reactors are in meltdown, and this ship will take out everything in sight with it. There is no escape. Don't forget, there's more of me, Gork. Prepare for impact. So basically, you kill him. He is now destroyed. He's no longer barring the way to escape from the demilitarized zone, supposedly. But that destruction also happened to completely wipe out the secret lab. Why is this significant? It means that the cloning facility, that tether that was made from Sector 7 to Sector 1, it can't be stopped now. So Sector 1 is now continually pumping out clones, ladies and gentlemen, and it's not stopping. This may or may not be a problem with the continuation of a story that we have for you in Everspace 2. If you want to see more of how all of this uh, occurs and how it plays out, I do encourage you to go through the full game yourself uh, because that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be very enjoyable. Um, there's also a, a very, uh, very nice crater that you get to see once you complete the uh, tasks at hand after you've defeated Admiral Kryn Gork. Um, it's, it's absolutely delightful. So that's the story. That is everything uh, of Everspace One and how everything moves through. What your decisions have done, like the ramifications in the DMZ are pretty massive. You're just a body replacement for Adam. And then he realizes, no, you're actually a person. And yet you have eliminated a lot of outlaw. You've killed off a lot of Okar. You've destroyed some GMB facilities along the way just for a selfish Adam and wanting to try and survive. And not only that, but now there's tens, if not hundreds of you being pumped out, flying all around the DMZ, doing this. Woo! Woo! <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Uh, so I have one more clip that I want to show up, just because I think that this is also a lot of fun. Um, so I was in another person's stream of uh, Melodic Oak. Uh, he was a fun character. I we actually jumped in on uh, on his stream and we didn't say a word of who we were. I know Hazy Devil was in there with me. That was a lot, a lot of fun. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and pop this bad boy open and I'll show uh, the next three. one of his conversations. He was actually talking about games that he's looking forward to. And yeah, I mean, this is a little bit like it's a feel good for us. But I just wanted to to, to throw this out there because because it was fun. Again, he has no idea who I am. No idea who I am, uh, but I was just enjoying his stream. Uh, lots and lots of fun. So here it goes. I'm trying to think of what the next three games I'm most excited about are. Uh, uh, there's a big part of me that wants to jump right on and say Everspace 2 because uh, I, you know, a couple nights ago I was really like reading through all the devlogs and uh, watching the videos, the vlogs and stuff, and like quite excited about that, which is why I'm playing it here. Um,. Oh, I just like that. Look at that. It's very Star Foxy. I'm trying to think about the next. <laughs> so the 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 context, a little bit of context behind this is that we're just like screwing around in chat, talking about just random stuff, right? Like I'm not even not even pushing this narrative of being part of Rockfish staff at, at all. And Hazy Devils in there were having a good time, um, and that's what came up. That's a lot of fun. Without him even knowing, he was just like, "Yeah, I'm really looking forward to Everspace too. It's like in my top three games of looking forward to." That feels really good. That feels really good. So it's been an absolute blast running into uh, people who are streaming um, and just like seeing the conversations that they share. Oh my gosh, it is such a freaking good time. Um, and I'm going to be doing more of this, by the way, uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks and whatnot. Uh, I'll send you guys links into the Discord uh, under the um, stream channel where I will be watching people streaming but not revealing who i am and i would be thrilled if the community could get behind that show them some love show them support get all hyped for them and playing everspace and showing them that like our community is is a really positive and, and just like a friendly force uh because it's a lot of fun to do this it was so good
So, like I said, I will be doing that uh, more in the Discord, so you can play play with the people with me. Uh, but I am also going to take a, a snippet of this that we showed on our Friday stream, and I'm going to send it to them. Because I was telling them about uh, showing up and, and watching these streams. Unfortunately, I don't see them. Unfortunately. That would have been really hilarious if he was watching. But, uh, excellent. All right. Uh, last little bit of thing. I know that we are over time, so thank you all for your patience and how long everything's taken. There's so much lore to talk about, as you've seen. Like, this game is incredibly deep. It's incredibly deep. There's so much to talk about. Uh, and what it's established for what can occur in Everspace 2, it, it could be, it could be so many different things. But what we do know is where, where Everspace 2 begins is that you are playing as a clone who is hiding. You don't want anybody knowing that you're a clone, right? That's what we understand at the very start of Everspace 2. You're just working for the GMB and then some stuff goes down. And that's where it all begins. All right. So, uh, let's talk about, um, let's talk about the... Let's see, over here we had an announcement made very recently uh, regarding Love is in the Air. Uh, Matt Samuri, our new community manager, ended up posting this for us all. I'm just going to read it out loud because I know the text is really, really small there, so no worries. It says, good day pilots, it's February and Valentine's Day is right around the corner. If there is one thing we really love around here... It is the amazing screenshots you like to create and share. We want to see more, and we really do. So for the next seven days, now six days, we will be accepting screenshots of either Everspace or from the Everspace 2 prototype. At the end of the week, we're going to open up a voting thing. We'll have more information on this uh, the sooner we get there with everything. Uh, but basically, submit your screenshots to specifically our screenshot contest channel in the Discord. Take lots of beauty pretties that kind of have like this theme about Valentine's Day. You can also manipulate the image a little bit if you want, uh, using like color grading, maybe add some words on top of it, stuff like that. Make it look like a Valentine's Day card, whatever. Just make sure that the screenshot itself is like legitimately from the game. Don't like plaster on different ships and stuff like that. Um, and have fun with it. And because we're going to revel in that. And by the end of next week, we're going to reward your efforts with a little bit of something something from our team to you. So please get involved, get excited. We love these little community contests and we're gonna be doing more of them in the future. So stay, stay tuned. It's not gonna just be screenshots, guys. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I know that also I wanna give Tulo Tulameo a shout out for promoting another one of the challenges, which has been the racetrack in the Everspace 2 prototype. This is a little bit more exclusive because you have to be a backer. Um, but if you do have the prototype, I do encourage you guys to duke it out and see if you can get the fastest score there. I don't know. Maybe we'll have a prize for you as well. It'll be good. So uh, keep doing what you're doing because we're having a lot of fun doing it. And I think that's all I got. You guys have been really great today and listen to me babble about all of this lore and the story and oh my goodness, lots and lots of details, way more than I think you thought you knew, even those veterans out there. Oh, Grindel, I didn't even show off your timeline. Okay, last thing, last thing I swear, it's the last thing. Um, I do, I really want to show you guys here, hang on a second, I want to, I don't want to get like too crazy with all my, my computering here. Um, I do want to show you this really crazy awesome timeline that Grindel put together. He is our wiki editor our leading wiki editor he is a freaking champion among men if you do not know who he is shame on you he is brilliant um and he's very very active all the time inside of our wiki channel on discord so i am at the everspace.gamepedia.com slash timeline website where he actually catalogs the full timeline of everything occurring in everspace okay how freaking neat is that how freaking neat is that? And it's from all the codex entries that we read through the stream, and it's cataloging them all in chronological order. So, wow. Like, this is just really great work. It's got some really cool information, like, including the births of all the characters and showing you, like, their ages and stuff like that uh, in relationship to one another and how it all goes down, like... Major mad props to you, Grindel, for putting this together. And he says, can't wait to expand it. 
Oh man, I can't either. It's going to get so exciting. So thank you for doing that. And thanks for all the contributions from everybody in our community. You guys really make this so much fun to just like talk about and shine. Uh, so keep doing what you're doing. And we will continue having a blast in all things Everspace and beyond. So uh, without further ado, I need to wrap things up. Um, so let's go ahead and I, I went to the wrong screen. Whoops. Uh, I want you to join that discord for more active fun and shenanigans. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be poking into people's streams and dropping links into the discord so that you can join in said shenanigans. It should be a good time. You can also follow us on Twitch, uh, excuse me, on Twitter at Rockfish Games and the game site itself. You can follow at Everspace underscore game as well as on Twitch, YouTube, Mixer, Steam, all of that fun stuff. We're everywhere. It's hard to find us, or it's hard to not find us. We're like clones spread across the galaxy. Oh my goodness. Oh, and uh, yeah. So it's it's great. It's a great, good, fun time. Um, I think that's all I have. I think that's I think that's legitimately it. So I'm just gonna transition back over to here for uh, one last special announcement, and that is don't stop being awesome. I won't stop being Eric Schrader, the community ambassador for Rockfish Games, and wait, I said that weird. No, you guys are awesome. I'm, I'm, gosh dang it, I messed it up. You know what I'm saying, dang it. You're awesome. Don't stop being awesome. Toodles, ah, toodles. Oh no, I ghosted, I ghosted Bloodstar. What did I miss? Oh crap, it's video, dang it. <laughs> Next time Bloodstar, I promise. Sorry about that. <laughs>